My name is Dan, and I run a website called marginallyclever.com, and my day job is on that website, I build and sell robots on the internet. Um, so you ask about liberties and freedoms. Five years ago, I was working building websites, uh, piecemeal contract work, I really hated it. I saved up and went to Burning Man, and it blew my mind. And the first two years after that, I go back, and then I'd spend 51 weeks of the year wishing I was there. And then I got, you know, I woke up and said, "Why don't you, Why don't you bring that kind of happiness and enjoyment of your daily life home with you?" That's what they keep telling you to do there. So, so I said, "What I really want to be doing? I, I want to make robots." So that's what I did. And in order to the first time I tried to make parts, I had them milled by a machinist out of aluminum and three parts about about yay big cost me in the order of $600. So, yeah. Uh, These three pieces I printed out, they were about 20 minutes each. I designed them in SolidWorks so that they, they fit together like this and it's the base for one of my, my, my robot kits. I pass this around and um, notice you'll feel the edge there and if you look closely, it's hard to see in this light, but you'll see the layering, because it's made like a cake, one layer at a time. So, and here we have, this is a gearbox. This is a hypocycloid gearbox. Um, I don't know if any of you are mechanical engineers, but um, I would love to make this out of metal if I could. Oh, I, I fixed the problem. This is another part for, the, for a similar robot. This was a mistake. Uh, I made this first with three corners to it, and there are screws that go in the holes. And then I said, I'm going to make one of four. And then I went to put the screws in and realized that because my computer model didn't have the screws, they were going to overlap in space. So I could get like three sets in, but the fourth I couldn't because there was already a screw in the way. And it took me 20 minutes to fix. If I had done that out of aluminum, I'd be $100 poorer. And a week later, and I'd be probably in tears or in, in my beer, certainly. Um, On the question of fasteners, like, is this precise enough where you could print it where the holes are already threaded? Like, say you need to thread the holes on them? You can certainly print higher quality than I'm doing. Uh, you can buy a commercial machine that would probably include the threading. I put in holes that are slightly undersized and then I tap them myself. It's just easier. Um, yeah, so I'm now doing what I want just about every day, and machines like this enable me to do that. I heard someone asking, does this free you from the dependency chain of going to a big box store? Well, if someone wanted to take the time for no money to design a, I don't know, a toaster and then give you the parts so that you can print them. Of course, this would be a toaster entirely made out of plastic, so I don't know how well it would work. Before your toast cooked, the plastic would melt. Um, there are drawbacks like that. And although you're free from, you know, you can just go to Thingiverse, get any model on it, it's free, print it out, it's, it's like an hour. Uh, to fill the whole volume, if I had enough plastic to do that, would be something on the order of two days, maybe more than that. Um, this is a RepRap. Um, it is a Prusa. Uh, it's running the Mendel firmware. It's, uh, it's about six months old now. You can get them, like I said, about 600 bucks. It took me, I think, two solid days to put this together and another four scratching my head to figure out why it wasn't perfect and to get it going. Uh, and that included going to a friend who could print me out a new part because the one that they sent me was a little bit off and some little finer things like that. Um, it's, it's like people who have fancy cars. You know, you ever go to a car meet and you see this big 10 guy there and they're like, don't wear your shoes and get in. Um, some people really love their machines and make them run beautifully. They just sing. Uh, I depend on mine, so it, it runs pretty good. Um, but I'm really at a case of I, I get it as good as I need, and, and then I'm on to something else. Um, yeah. I'm just waiting for this to cool now so I can take the parts off. I think the only frustration I have with this machine is the amount of time I have to wait for the bed to heat up, and then I have to wait for it to cool down before I can take my print out. In a perfect world, it would be hot, print, cool, remove, repeat. So I've actually managed to pay off this machine now by printing things for other commercial customers. 
and I'm hoping that in the near future I can get a second one and maybe a third and then while I'm waiting for one to cool down the next one's already hot and going and I, my output will be fantastic. It's beautiful because I'm uh, the sort of, I wouldn't say type A, but I, I feel guilty when I'm not working, which is, you know, how do you enjoy yourself, right? And, but now I turn this on in the morning, I take the, the orders from last night, I put them in my backpack and I walk my dogs to the post office, and I know that no matter how long I stand up there and watch these two mutts tear at each other, I'm working technically because this is printing the next parts for the next kit at home which makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> so I'm going to try and peel these off now, and hopefully they work. Shapeways and Shapeways will um, take any design you send them and print it for you in a variety of metal, ceramic, plastic. Uh, they may even do glass now, I don't know. And then if you design it, you can also resell it through Shapeways and get a percentage from it. So as a designer, if you just want to make 3D models all day and then advertise them and have people, have someone else do the labor work, you don't even have to keep inventory anymore, which is, uh, which is pretty wild. Please. So I just heard, or just read yesterday, I think, I don't know when this guy did it, but he, he's some professor and he used, I don't know if this is 3D printing or he's just reusing the technology, but he basically laid down uh, chemicals and then mixed other chemicals and they created artificial, the idea is he can create artificial drugs like on the spot, kind of thing, like ibuprofen or something like that. And so. But I couldn't really tell, I don't know if you've heard anything about this, but I couldn't tell if he was just reusing the technology that's available, or if it really was 3D printing somehow. Uh, I can't speak to that specific instance, but I do know that there was a TED talk recently where live on stage they were printing a kidney from human tissue. Right. If you have a supply of the right kind of stem cells, and you extrude them through a nozzle, you can put them down in any shape you like. So why not a kidney? Um, How does that deal with gene expression? I, I asked the DIY biohackers. How long? <laughs> how long until you can you can have your entire body scanned, put in a computer, and then reprinted? And if it has the same neural structure as you do, then would it have your memories? <laughs> okay. I mean, the precision is pretty high, but. Yeah. You know it's gonna turn out like Futurama. Everyone, every guy's gonna have Lucy Dubois or something. You know. No. It, it could be. Uh, uh, there's certainly potential for it. And it, you know, uh, um, there was a book called Altered Carbon where uh, cloning was perfectly, uh, perfectly normal. And the only crimes that left in the world were true death, which is to blow up the chip in the back of your head that they use to to copy your brain, or to have two copies of yourself running around. Because with the duplicated DNA and the shared ideas, you could commit all kinds of fraud that would be impossible in, in a single person identity kind of world. Yeah. Um, so maybe these are some of the problems that are coming with 3D printers. Way to be on the bleeding edge. <laughs> so I'm curious about your business. What sort of customers do you normally have? What do they order from you? Okay. 
Um, I make educational robots. Um, I really believe, like I said, this took me about a week to get going, and I already know a lot about computers. I, I know computer programming, I design models, I'm comfortable with electronics, that kind of thing. But the young people who are coming up, you know they say the robots are going to take all our jobs, right? So in 30 years, it's the people who know how to maintain and build these things who have the most job security. So I'm trying to educate them now in some of this stuff. Uh, my big seller is a robot that hangs on a wall and draws murals. Um, it, it just has two motors at the top and it does a trigonometry to move a pen around. Uh, actually, version 2 is coming out March 8, and it, uh, the big change it has is that it can lift the pen. All the old models did every drawing as an enormous single zigzag line with more zigzags in the dark areas and less in the light. And the new one, you can produce full documents. I'm thinking the first test image it comes with will be the three laws of robotics. <laughs> Just so people don't worry too much. Um, the first robot I built was a crab that walked. It was, it's still the only one that's open source. You can read the code and learn how to build your own, and the plans are open source as well. Um, and the first time I was going to turn it on, I, told, I gave my girlfriend a stick, and I told her, look, if it kills me, you, you hit it, and then this is the button you want to reset it. Then you got about four seconds to smash its legs off. And I just like to freak people out sometimes, so... Um, yeah. I, so I make educational robots. I make uh, Delta robots. I, I've made um, uh, CNC type machines like this. And my big dream is to build a robotic arm. With, there's a lot of people who've built simple robotic arms that have one, two, three, four, five. But all of the, the, the less, like under $10,000, nobody has six. Has that six range of motion. So you can't do things like you can't build an arm that does this around a point. And that's, that's crucial for doing virtually any kind of work. Try and do something without turning your wrist. And you'll see it's, it's very, very hard. So I'm hoping to, with things like this 3D printer to be able to test out all the parts. And I've gained experience from my other robots with the motors to be able to hopefully piece by piece put the whole thing together. And I would love to be able to market that for $2,000 and be the next, the next game changer like this. If you can build an arm, you just take the hand off and you put a nozzle like this and it becomes a 3D printer that can print upside down or it can print sideways. One of the limitations of this machine is that you, because you have to plan from the bottom up when you're printing, you can't do a shape like, um, like the golden arches. The bit in the middle, it would try to print that and it'd be hanging in space so the plastic would just go all over the bed and you'd get nothing. The other solution is you have two kinds of material um, in the professional models that'll print out the stuff that dissolves in, in salt water, I think it is. So you print some of this black stuff and your plastic on top, and then you take the whole model and you put it in this bath, and about a day later you pull it out and it's all been dissolved and you've got your plastic model. But nobody seems to sell that at, at this level. So if you can print sideways or upside down, that solves that issue. And then you can take the nozzle off and put in a drill instead and cut, and all your manufacturing can happen. I'm hoping to, I would love to have six or seven of them in a line, making kits in my garage, and then I would just spend my days playing R&D and customer service. I hope that answers the question. I, I do tend to remember. Anyone? How? I, people want to talk about how this is going to liberate us, so. How do you picture that? Let, let's, let's explore that possibility. How to get away from that, you need to be able to replace parts of it, which means you need to be able to reverse engineer the part that you happen to be missing. Is that, are there scanners? Like, what kind of advances yeah, are kind of coming in that area? Yeah, yeah like, I, I was. Well, here's the part I missed. Like, without the, either the part itself or the gap of the part tells you what part you need. Do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a Japanese company I read about recently, a bunch of artists, and you and, you and if you want, your, your honey. You stand in front of their scanner system, they photograph and scan a 3D model of you. They print it out about yay big and then they paint it. So it's a miniature model of you and, or the two of you or whatever. Um, the scanners now are getting much better. You can, you can probably build one with a laser scanner and a turntable. 
put your model in the center and, uh, and you've got something. Uh, you have to fill in the holes and a few things, but it's, it's definitely coming. I also read about a guy who broken a little plastic cover on the inside of his, his mini wagon, uh, minivan. Uh, and the cover to replace it from the dealer was something like $200, and he'd get six of them, and he only needed the one. So he measured it out with some calipers, printed a new one, cost him a total of about two hours, and whatever that was, like five square centimeters of, of plastic, cube centimeters. So it's, it's definitely coming. That, that you, the, the chain is breaking down, but it's more like you now have one dependence instead of ten dependents. And it's that plastic, and it's the motors, and it's the electronics. So that's a good business idea. Plastic yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I have a good business idea for you. 3D puzzles with this machine. I've actually done that. I, I, oh. I've got designs at home for it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's a variation on that. It's a jigsaw puzzle for the blind because it's a relief design on the top. You can feel the puzzles oh, cool. and then put it together. No, what I was talking about is like, let's say... Yeah, 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 there's jigsaw puzzles that you build like Big Ben and yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, an object that you could construct. I like to think that all of the kits that I sell, I sell them as a fully assembled version and a completely unassembled version. That's marginalphoto.com. Um, and uh, the fully unassembled version is a hell of a puzzle for the people who, who want to put in that much effort. Uh, for the rest, you just want to draw cool pictures. Um, I've seen recently there's a new patent that was just filed for some guys who worked out a way with inkjets to print uh, conductive circuits. So uh, the first example they showed was that they built an RC plane and instead of having to run cabling through the wings for the lights and the motors, they just printed it right into the body of the wing, reducing the weight and the, the total number of breakage points and resulting in a more efficient plane design. Uh, there's no reason that you couldn't, you know, in I don't know how long in the future, but you could print an entire wing out of solar collecting material and it would run on electricity and stay up forever. So, or at least until, you know, structural phasing, whatever. Where is electronics? Is it instead of just having like a black piece, you just print a 3D and have a 3D chip? Yeah. yeah. Chips. yeah. I, I don't know how you cool those chips, but it's definitely possible. It is all kinds of yeah. Yeah, yeah. These the uh, this thing has an accuracy of well, it's, it's high. I haven't measured it exactly. The layers are 0.2 millimeters thick, and I know some people have gotten them down to less than 0.1. So we're into microns at that point. 50 microns high. You can't you can see, but you can't feel the layering. And that incidentally, that's another problem with some of these. Um, the layers tend to delaminate in some circumstances, so you have to plan ahead for that. Uh, some people will use uh, acetone to melt the, the sides of it, which smooths them out and melts them together a little bit. But the inside of the cake is still very similar. Um, and one of the other nice things is this: these may look solid, but you can tell the printer, only fill in the interior bits 10%. And it will run a kind of a zigzag pattern through there to build enough of a lattice that it's got something to hold up the top. But it, if you cut it in half, you'd see it's mostly air in there, which is a great way to save on plastic. Uh, I've had, I bought a three kilo spool for 80 bucks six months ago. I'm still working on my first one, and I'm printing just about every day. Uh, often, I think the most I printed in a day was maybe 10 pieces. You saw I, I have a habit of labeling them all so that afterwards I can go back and why did this one work and why did this one didn't? And what about the one last week? Which one was that again? All oh, right. So, I'm very OCD compared to some of my friends. Uh, yeah. So. Do all these printers work in layers, or are there designs that are, you know, there's a lot that work in Like, I mean, with what you said about the cake kind of design, which has some drawbacks, are there printers now that do, do it differently? Um, I, I know that in the milling world, uh, this is additive, they add layers. In the, mil in the reductive methods, they get you a big block and they cut away from it. Which, um, if you've got, like I said, a robotic arm or some other kind of multi-axis milling machine, you can come in and do some pretty wild designs. And that will not have the layering problem. There's also a machine now where um, 
He's got a bed of like this orangish liquid and a, and a projector underneath. And uh, the, the top comes down, just touches the liquid, and then very slowly pulls out as the, the light cooks the liquid onto the surface. And it's, it's amazing. You see this shape rise out of nothing. There was a pool of just liquid and a solid shape comes out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I keep thinking of um, uh, King Arthur and the Lady of the Lake, you know, the, the sword just comes out of nowhere. Um, yeah. There's a, another guy at the VHS who, who's making a machine called the Tiny, which would probably wouldn't fit on the end of this table. It's, it's an ironic name. But he made a, a dagger about yay big out of plastic. And if you could do the same out of metal, yeah, it, it, would, it would last longer than the gun parts and be just as dangerous. So. Ultimately, some of these parts, though, like if there was low bearing, uh, I mean, you could leave a hole a little bit bigger and like, put a metal bushing in there or something like that. To Absolutely. Yeah. There's certainly parts on here that are metal just because they take that much more uh, stress. Uh, but every one of them could have been modeled in 3D and printed on the machines. Um, I've seen all kinds of jewelry. I've seen uh, mechanical parts, obviously. Are there toys that Oh yeah, yeah. This 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 little train here. This is the tiniest model. Uh, the same page on Thingiverse mm -hmm. had a whole train set. Where the parts were about the size of my thumb. Mm -hmm. So with a track that you could print out. You remember the little wooden track that kids have that comes in sections and they kind of yeah. jigsaw together. There's on Thingiverse you can find those same parts and people have designed their own to expand on the kit. So if there's a piece of that train track you really wanted or that your, your nephew doesn't have or your niece, whatever, go ahead and put it up. Yeah. I was just thinking when I was a kid, like, I would have some like this and like, make my own G.I. Joe's and that stuff. Um, I've, so seen, <laughs> I've seen... I've been to a couple of conferences where you see kids playing with these machines and by far, laser cutters blow their minds so much more than these machines. These are slow, these are hot, these are these have a high voltage. They're dangerous, and they do take begging to keep them working right. The laser cutters generally they come in a kit. You know, you put on your safety goggles. If you open the door, it turns off, and it just it's done in a minute. I was late getting here because I was printing out ten sets of boxes for one of my new from my new upcoming thing, and uh, it was done. Next piece. Just don't stare at it too long, and you know, burn your retinas out. And uh, it's it's far more it grabs them a lot. Yeah. So if you can plan your designs, it, it's a it's a puzzle to how do you plan it so you can make it entirely flat and then put it together. Yeah. Uh, do you see the, do you foresee an explosion in intellectual property law, uh, or do you think they'll just not be able to keep up with the technology? Uh, there are commercial companies who have the financial resources to apply for patents. Most of the people who, the hobbyists who are doing work, release it open source, Creative Commons license, which basically means you, you can't copyright it after that, that particular design. That there's certainly designs I would love to patent if I could, but first you need two years and something like five grand to get a patent, and then you need a war chest big enough to defend the patent. So if you get a really juicy patent, and someone like GE or Ford wants your patent, you're probably going to lose that patent. Uh, you know, you, you might get a movie deal out of it 10 years later, like that guy who made the wipers on the car. <laughs> I don't know if anyone actually saw that film. Yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, they gave away the whole plot in the, the trailer. Uh, he made it. They tried to take it. He won the end. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm sure there's there'll be an explosion of, of patents. You know, I'm actually hoping that the patents will expire on a couple that already exist. Like this has to get to 110 for the plastic to stick, <coughs> and this has to be over 200 degrees to melt the plastic. And when I turned that on, and we all mingled and emptied our bladders and filled our glasses, eh, we had to wait. It's only because I'm waiting for this thing to reheat because someone had kicked the power switch. There's a version, the professional models all have this in a sealed box. It's just hidden away. It looks cool, but the real purpose is so they can heat all the air inside the box really fast. And that makes it much, much quicker to bring. If everything's already 100 degrees, it's easy to, to, to get, go to the last 10 
and, and get going. They patent in the box. Yeah, there's a patent on the box around the machine. And <laughs> I saw a patent a couple days ago for a 3D printer with a robot arm sitting next to it so that the arm could unload it automatically. Uh, no. <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> Yeah. And some other, um, the big company, MakerBot, everyone thinks they were the first to do this stuff. They were just the first to make a cheap model and make you feel like you could do it yourself. They tried a version with a, um, a little conveyor belt here, and this plastic would roll, so the part would come off, and then as it rolled, it would peel off and just fall out of the machine. So theoretically, you could set up 10 of them in a row and go, but just about everybody's gotten rid of the conveyor belts because they were crap. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. It's really cool to see these technologies uh, starting to uh, uh, become practical and so on. Um, about almost 15 years ago, I read this book by Andrew Galapos. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but um, he was this libertarian guy from the 1960s. And um, lots of valuable stuff in there, but what I got out of it was he said essentially there's two ways to try and change the world. The one is the political strategy, where you have to get everyone to agree, or you physically force them to, to do what you want. And the other is the entrepreneurial technological strategy, which is what he was in favor of. And um, that's way more effective, because all you do is you just build something that people want, and then by the people using it, the world changes. I mean, look at the impact that Apple has had in the world. It's unbelievable, or Microsoft, or any of those companies and that 3D printing is going to have on the world. So in terms of technology, I think there are three legs that are essential for a free society. And, and really how I look at it is the, um, we have to shift from a centralized to a decentralized system. And there's three aspects that, that have to be in place. The first is decentralized communications, where uh, Phil Zimmerman in 1994 developed PGP, which allowed us communicate in an encrypted way, uh, decentralized and no one can control it on any of the uh, yeah. 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 the authorities off, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> Absolutely, they pounded them, but eventually they, they couldn't control it, so they gave up. Um, so that's communication. So uh, the second is decentralized financial transactions. So you don't just share information, but you can actually transfer value between people. And so now, now you're starting to get into the economic realm that you can actually do stuff in a decentralized way and it can be controlled. But the third thing is that you need decentralized production. So no longer is there one big entity or a few where they can you know, put their levers on. So once you have decentralized communication, financial transaction, and production, yeah. you, know, you don't even have to argue about libertarian ideas or whatever. It's just that's going to be the reality. So we're building the world we want as opposed to arguing for it. Yeah. Cool. We've got two of them here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're very correct in all of that. Um, I, I, the, um, the number of, of possibilities that it has opened up for me have been enormous. And I, I find that the first thing that people think of when they think of getting a 3D printer, the biggest question I usually get from a young entrepreneur is, can I make with it? How creative can you get with it? If you, you'll, you'll do better if you can find your own designs and print them and sell them. Um, I've done okay by printing things for other people, but that market will soon expire as more and more people get the machines. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a big feature in this, and it's, it's a matter of who's out in front that where, where can you find some designers? Cause I know I've tried and it takes like a long time to get good at designing their products. The, the beautiful thing is that it's cheap to make mistakes. So you print something out, doesn't work, print it again, doesn't work, print it out. My business so far has succeeded as a series of failures. Um, and that in that they are all new and interesting failures. So just don't repeat the same mistake twice, and the sky's the limit. Uh, where to find a good designer? I mean, the Emily cars around the corner. I'm sure you can find people who are 
And if that doesn't work, find some people who are good with Maya, who make, uh, make models for video games. I'm sure if you could print uh, a portal droid, anyone know the game Portal? Uh, you know, with a cute robots in it. One of the most popular things that people print out for the first time is a cube that, that had a heart on it that was used in the game. And it, for some reason, it's, it's very popular. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you want to know more about these machines, I'm happy to talk with anyone later. Uh, uh, if you want to see one running, uh, on a future date, by all means. At the Vancouver Hackspace, we have two of them and a giant laser cutter. Um, I have this machine. I have one sitting in my garage that doesn't work, that I, I've never really used, and a giant wood router. So if you want to see the kind that cut away to make things, um, that that's an option. Yes? You've mentioned the Vancouver Hackspace a couple times. Can you explain what is that? What Sorry. Is yes, the Vancouver Hackspace is down at 45 West Hastings, right next to the Savon Meats. You know where the Capoeira place is? Mm -hmm. It's actually upstairs from the Capoeira. And um, they, it's a communal sort of duocracy of making. So you get, a, you get a membership there, you get a key, you can go in whenever you want and make things. They have. If you don't have room for a full workshop in your house, go there, because they've already got every tool you ever want, short of maybe a, a two-ton folding press. But, uh, and they're, they're getting new digs soon, so they can get even more stuff. They've got, they've got an arcade machine that's also their sound system, and that searched the web, and they took out all the payment me me mechanism underneath and put in a drying rack for silk screens, so they can print their own t-shirts. Um, their encryption is, is pretty wild over there because they've got Bitcoin people and they r regularly run a security uh, night uh, where they, they get together and they talk about encryption and PGP and, and fighting the man. And um, <laughs> I had actually probably in those words. Um, uh, they've got, like I said, the laser cutter is a hot new attraction and two 3D printers that are rarely being used. So if you wanted to come in play with SolidWorks that they've got there. SolidWorks is a software for designing parts. If you wanted to play with SolidWorks, run the 3D printer and get a feel for it. Tuesday nights is their open night. Come, just come on in at about 7.30. The doors will be open. And they'll lower a key from the third floor because they're too lazy to walk down. And push the doorbell and look up. And, yeah. and um, if, you're, if you're interested in making things and duocracy and, and no one really telling you what to do, that's, that's a good place to go. Right. So once again, I, I'm Dan, and I'm on marginallyclever.com. Tell your friends, um, and hit me up on your phones, and DOS my site. And, uh, and thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. economies and telling IP to go to hell and all that good stuff. Uh, we are taking donations to cover the cost of this, so if you felt it was worthwhile, drop some coins in the old jar here. But other than that, we're happy to have them out, and we appreciate it. And we appreciate him coming out, and we'll definitely be keeping track of his website and all the progress to come. So. Let's give another hand for him and Paul.